The next sutta is 8.6.51. It's quite an interesting sutta. <coughs> Once while the exalted one was staying among the Sakyans in Banyan Tree Park at Kapilavatu, Mahapajapati, the Gotamit, came and visited him, and after saluting, stood at one side. Thus standing, she said to the exalted one, Lord, well were it that women folk should be allowed to go forth from the home to homeless life into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata. And the Buddha said, Enough, Gotamit, set not your heart upon the going forth of women from the home to the homeless life into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata. But Mahapajapati besieged him a second time and a third time in like manner, but the exalted one replied as before. Then Mahapajapati, the Gotamit, seeing that the exalted one would not permit women to go forth from the home, sad and sorrowful, in tears and sobbing, saluted him and departed, keeping him on her right. Just stop here to comment. Uh, this uh, Mahapajapati uh, was actually the um, foster mother of our Buddha. When our Buddha was young, uh, according to the legend, uh, seven days after our Buddha was born, the real mother passed away. And uh, then the mother's sister is this Mahapajapati. And Mahapajapati was also the wife of the Buddha's father. In the in the olden days, eh, a person could have as many wives as he could afford to keep. Eh. So, uh, so in actual fact, Mahapajapati was the auntie of the Buddha. And Mahapajapati had her own son by the name of Nanda. And as she brought up Nanda, she also brought up uh, and nursed our Buddha, just like her own son. And when the Buddha had uh, become enlightened uh, and came back to see the, the Sakyans uh, and taught them the Dhamma, and at that time, this uh, Mahapajapati uh, was already fairly old, so she wanted to become a nun. And she was the first to ask the Buddha for permission to ordain. But as you see here, the Buddha refused her permission. Now the Sutta continues. Now the Exalted One, when he had stayed at Kapilavatu as long as he desired, set out on a journey to Vesali, and in due course, going from place to place, arrived there. And the Exalted One dwelt near Vesali in Mahavana at the gabled hall. Then Mahapajapati, the Gotamit, having had her hair cut off and donned yellow robes, set out with a large company of Sakyan women for Vesali. And in due course, they drew near to the gabled hall in Mahavana near Vesali. And Mahapajapati stood outside the door, her feet swollen and her limbs covered with dust, sad and sorrowful, sobbing and in tears. Now the Venerable Ananda saw her standing th thus, with swollen feet and in tears, and said to her, Wherefore, Gotamit, do you stand, sad and sorrowful, outside the door? And she said, It is because, Reverend Ananda, the Exalted One will not allow women to go forth from the home to the homeless life into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata. And Venerable Ananda said, Then wait here, Gotamit, until I have asked the Exalted One to allow women to go forth from the home. And the Venerable Ananda went unto the Exalted One and saluted and sat down at one side. So seated, he spoke thus, Lord, Mahapajapati, the Gotamit, stands outside at the door, her feet swollen and her limbs covered with dust, sad and sorrowful, sobbing and in tears, saying, The Exalted One will not allow women to go forth. Lord, well were it that women should be allowed to go forth from the home to the homeless life, into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata. And the Buddha said, Enough, Ananda, set not your heart upon the going forth of women from the home to the homeless life, 
a second and a third time, Ananda besieged him in like manner, but the exalted one gave the same reply. Then thought the venerable Ananda, the exalted one will not allow women to go forth from the home to the homeless life. What if I were to ask the exalted one in another way? And he spoke thus, Lord, if women go forth from the home to the homeless life, into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata, can they realize the fruit of stream winning, of one's returning, of non-returning, and of arahanship? And the Buddha said, They can, Ananda. And Venerable Ananda said, Lord, if they can, since Mahapajapati has been of great service to the Exalted One, for as his aunt, nurse and foster mother, she gave him milk when the Exalted One's mother died, well worried that women should be allowed to go forth. And the Buddha said, If Ananda, Mahapajapati the Gotamit, receive these eight cardinal rules, it shall be for her the ordination. 1. Though she has been ordained a hundred years, a nun must pay respect, raise her hands in salutation, rise up from her seat and salute a monk who has but that day been ordained. This is a rule to be honoured, respected, revered, venerated and never to be transgressed during her life. 2. A nun must not spend the rainy season where there is no resident monk. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 3. Twice a month a nun must question the Sangha concerning the date of the Uposatha day and the next time of preaching. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 4. After the raining seas rainy season, a nun must keep the pavarana before both sanghas in respect of three matters, those seen, those heard, and those suspected. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 5. A nun guilty of a serious offence must undergo a penance before both sanghas for the half month. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 6. After training for two rainy seasons in the six rules, a nun must seek full ordination of both sanghas. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 7. Not on any pretext must a nun revile or abuse a monk. This is a rule never to be transgressed. 8. From today, Ananda, admonition by nuns of monks is forbidden. But admonition of nuns by monks is not forbidden. This is a rule to be honoured, respected, revered, venerated, and never to be transgressed during life. If Mahapajapati receive these eight cardinal rules, it shall be for her the ordination. Now when the Venerable Ananda had learned these eight rules from the Exalted One, he went to Mahapajapati and told her all the Exalted One had said. And she asked, answered him and said, Varun Ananda, just as a woman or man, young and tender in years and fond of dress, would, after washing the head, receive with both hands a garland of lotus flowers, of jasmine flowers, or of some sweet-scented creeper, and place it on top of the head. Even so, I, sir, receive these eight cardinal rules, never to be transgressed all my life. Then the Venerable Ananda returned to the Exalted One, saluted him and sat down at one side. So seated, he said, Lord, Mahapajapati, the Gotamit, has received the eight rules. And the Buddha said, If, Ananda, women had not been allowed to go forth from the home to the homeless life into the Dhamma Vinaya declared by the Tathagata, then long would have lasted the holy life. For a thousand years would have sat Dhamma or true Dhamma would sat Dhamma or true Dhamma have lasted. But now, Ananda, since women have gone forth, not for long will the holy life last. Now, Ananda, just for five hundred years will the true Dhamma last. Just as those clans that have many women and but few men easily fall a prey to robbers and pot thieves, even so, Ananda, 
In whatever Dhamma Vinaya, women are allowed to go forth from the home to the homeless life. That holy life will not last long. Just as when the disease known as white as bones falls upon a field of ripened rice, that field does not last long. Even so, Ananda, in whatever Dhamma Vinaya, women are allowed to go forth, that holy life will not last long. Just as when the disease known as red rust falls upon a field of ripened sugar cane, that field does not last long. Even so, Ananda, in whatever Dhamma Vinaya, women are allowed to go forth, that holy life will not last long. And now, Ananda, just as a man might build a dike to a great reservoir with a view to the future so that no water could pass beyond it, even so I, Ananda, with a view to the future, have laid down for nuns these eight cardinal rules which must not be transgressed so long as they live. That's the end of the sutta. So we see from here, after... Maha Pajapati could not get permission of the Buddha to go forth. And then he followed the Buddha all the way, uh, walking from Kapilavatu to Vesali. And according to the commentary, uh, there was a distance of about 200 miles. So that was a pretty long way to walk. Uh. And... Uh, so the Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha again for permission for women to go forth. Huh? And three times the Buddha refused him. Huh? And then after that huh, he thought of another way to, to, to get round it huh? and reminded the, the Buddha huh, that the Buddha owed very much huh, to Maha Pajapati huh, who brought her up, huh, gave her milk when she when was small, etc., and uh, so the Buddha relented, and the Buddha uh, made uh, eight rules uh, for nuns. Uh. The first one uh, is that even a nun has been ordained a long time, uh, she must pay respect uh, to a monk, any monk, even though he's very newly ordained. Then second rule uh, is that a monk... Mm, must not spend the rainy season, the Vasa, eh, where there is no resident monk. In the Theravada tradition, eh, every year during the rainy season eh, in India, eh, they had the rainy season, the winter and the summer seasons, eh, three seasons. Eh. And uh, three months out of the four months, eh, a monk or a nun eh, must stay in a fixed place eh, and uh, not leave the place more than six continuous nights. Uh. So for a nun, uh, she must spend the vasa in a place where there are monks, uh, at least one monk. And the third condition is that twice a month, uh, a nun uh, must ask the bhikkhu sangha for the date of the uposatha, because I think they have to recite the precepts. Uh in front of the monk and then the time of preaching because the, uh, every two weeks uh, they would have to be given a teaching uh, by a senior monk. And the fourth rule uh, is after the rainy season a nun must keep the pavarana before both sanghas. Pavarana is an invitation to criticize. Uh, it is also uh, practiced by monks uh, and monks have spent the uh, Vasa, the rainy season, uh, and after the three months of the rainy season, sometimes uh, there is some ill will uh, between monks. So they have to, each one of them, uh, they have to, uh, in a Sangha gathering, uh, starting from the most senior monk, uh, they have to invite criticism from the other monks. Uh, invite the monks to criticize them uh, in case the, any of the monks has seen or heard or suspected anything wrong, uh, then uh, the monk invites criticism. So for a case, in the case of a nun, uh, she has in, to invite the nuns to criticize her and later uh, she has to ask the monks to invite the monks to criticize her as well. Uh. 
The fifth ruler is a, a nun. If she has undergone a serious offense, meaning a sangha disease, the second most serious offense for a monk or a nun is a sangha disease. For example, to touch somebody of the opposite sex purposely. Uh, out of a lustful desire, uh, or to say some lewd words, uh, some vulgar words, uh, etc. Uh, so, for this class of serious offense, uh, she a nun must undergo a penance before both sanghas, the monks and the nuns. The sixth rule, uh, after training for two rainy seasons, that means for two years in the six rules, uh, a nun, uh, she cannot uh, immediately become a nun. She has to keep six precepts uh, for two years. Uh, that was uh, partly because once there was a nun who came to ordain, and after she was ordained, uh, then she became pregnant. And that was uh, not because she did anything wrong, but because uh, she was married uh, before she ordained. So after she ordained, she conceived, and then people talk bad about her. So uh, this was probably the main reason why the Buddha made a rule that a nun must spend two years before she gets the full ordination. And then the seventh rule is that a nun must not revile or abuse a monk. And the eighth rule is that monks can criticize nuns, but nuns are not allowed to criticize monks. Uh, now, sometimes uh, uh, women are not happy uh, with this uh, kind of discrimination uh, against women, but um, it's partly because uh, women are more emotional uh, than men, so that if they are kind, then they are kinder than men. But if they are angry or hateful, then they become much more hateful than men. So, uh, that's for this reason. And um, towards the end, the Buddha told Ananda that if women had not been allowed to go forth, and then uh, the true Dhamma would have lasted 1,000 years. But because women had gone forth, then the true Dhamma would now last only 500 years. And so we can see uh, that the, un the Dhamma was unadulterated uh, for 500 years. And after 500 years, after the Buddha's passing away, uh, from that time onwards, uh, new books were written, new books uh, that contradicted the earlier discourses of the Buddha. So that if we study the suttas, uh, we find the earliest four Nikayas, the Diga Nikaya, Majima Nikaya, Sangyutta Nikaya, and Anguttara Nikaya. These are the earliest discourses of the Buddha. These, if you read the suttas, uh, there are no contradictions generally. Uh, but if you read later books, uh, then you find uh, there's contrad older books, and then the new newer books, uh, they contradict uh, each other as well. Uh, so we have to be very careful uh, now that the Dhamma has become polluted. It doesn't mean that the 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 true Dhamma uh, is is lost. Uh, the true Dhamma is still here, but uh, it is um, mixed up with a lot of our Dhamma, what is contrary to Dhamma. So it is very difficult uh, for people uh, to distinguish between the real Dhamma and the fake Dhamma. And so, uh, if you don't get uh, the proper guidance, uh, uh, for because most people don't have the time to study all the books to find out, uh, then uh, you might get some wrong views. Uh. So you see, uh, the reason the Buddha at first uh, refused permission for women to go forth uh, was actually to protect the Dhamma. He wanted the Dhamma to, pro to last longer to benefit more people. And he said, once women have gone forth, then the sasana, the, the Buddhist religion, has become weakened. 
uh, the teachings have become weakened and the Buddha gave an example uh, just as there are, uh, those clans uh, that have many women but few men uh, easy for, easily fall prey to robbers and pot thieves uh, uh, so in the same way uh, the, uh, once you have uh, women in the holy life uh, then the sasana is weakened uh, the next sutta, 8.6.52. Once while the exalted one was staying at the gable hall in Mahavana near Vesali, the venerable Ananda came to him and saluted and sat down at one side. So seated, he spoke thus to the exalted one. Lord, how many qualities must a monk have to be considered a spiritual advisor of nuns? A monk, Ananda, must have eight qualities. What eight? Here in Ananda, a monk is virtuous. He undertakes and trains himself in the precepts. He is learned. The doctrines he has fully understood in theory. To him both Patimoka have been properly and fully handed down, sec- sectioned, regulated and resolved into detail. He has a pleasant voice. His enunciation is good. His speech is urbane distinct, free from hoarseness and informative. He is able to instruct, incite, rouse and gladden the Sangha of nuns with religious discourse. Generally he is dear to and liked by the nuns. Previous to his taking this exalted one as his authority for going forth, for donning the yellow robe, he has been guilty of no serious crime. He has been ordained twenty years or more. A monk Ananda must have these eight qualities to be considered a spiritual advisor for nuns. That's the end of the sutta. I just uh, recapitulate these uh, conditions. Eh? The first one, a monk must be virtuous. He keeps the precepts. The second, secondly, he must be learned eh? in the Dhamma. Thirdly, um, he, the, both Patimokas, the monks Patimoka and the nuns Patimoka, he fully understands. Number four, he has a pleasant voice. Uh, number five, he is able to instruct the nuns uh, with religious uh, discourse uh, with the Dhamma. Number six, he is liked by the nuns. Number seven, he has been guilty of no serious crime. Number eight, he has been ordained twenty years or more. A monk who has been ordained ten years or more is called a Thera. A monk who has been ordained twenty years or more is called a Maha Thera. So these are the qualities. Eh? The next sutta is 8.6.53. Once in the gable hall at Vesali, Maha Pajapati, the Gotamit, spoke thus to the Exalted One. Well were it for me, Lord, if the Exalted One would teach me Dhamma briefly, so that after hearing the Exalted One's word, I might dwell alone, secluded, earnest, zealous and resolute. And the Buddha said, Those things of which you know thus, these things lead to passion, not to release therefrom. These to lead to bondage, not to release therefrom. These lead to the piling of rebirth, not to the dispersion thereof. These lead to wanting much, not to wanting little. These lead to discontent, not to contentment. These lead to sociability, not to solitude. These lead to indolence, not to exertion. These lead to luxury, not to frugality. Of these things, hold definitely, this is not Dhamma, this is not Vinaya, this is not the word of the teacher. But as to those things, Gotamit, which you know lead to dispassion, to release from bondage, to the dispersion of rebirth, to wanting little, to contentment, to solitude, to exertion, and to frugality, and in no case to their opposites, be assured that they are Dhamma, they are Vinaya, the word of the teacher. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is uh, giving a Dhamma teaching in brief uh, to the foster mother, uh, to the mother. 
and uh, these are the things uh, that uh, uh, is Dhamma in uh, in concise form uh, that uh, those things that uh, lead to dispassion uh, to release from bondage to dispersion of rebirth, to wanting little, to contentment, to solitude, to exertion, to frugality. Eh? These are consistent with the Dhamma Vinaya, but not their opposite. Eh? Eh? The next sutta is 8.6.54. Once the exalted one was dwelling among the Kolians at the market town called Kakarapata, there Long Ni, the Kolian clansman, visited the exalted one, and after greeting him, sat down at one side. So seated, he spoke thus to the exalted one, Lord, we householders are immersed in the round of pleasure. We are cumbered with bed, maid, and sons. We delight in the muslin cloth from Benares and in sandalwood. We deck ourselves with flowers, with garlands and cosmetics. We enjoy the use of both silver and gold, that is money. Lord, to such as us, let the exalted one also teach Dhamma, teach the things which will be to our advantage and for our happiness here on earth, for our advantage and happiness in the world to come. And the Buddha said, These four conditions, tiger foot, lead to a clansman's advantage and happiness here on earth. What for? Achievement in alertness, achievement in weariness, good company, and the even life. And what tiger foot is achievement in alertness? Let's stop here a moment. Uh. This tiger foot uh, must be the nickname uh, of this uh, person. Uh. This long knee uh, is Bhyaga Paja. Uh, his, his family name uh, was Biaga Paja, which is Tiger Foot. And uh, Long Mi uh, is uh, Diga Janu, uh, was his uh, uh, nickname. Uh, so here the Buddha addresses him uh, by his family name. And what Tiger Foot is achievement in alertness? Herein, by whatsoever activity a clansman make his living, whether by the plough, by trading, or by cattle herding, by archery, or as a Raja's man, or by any of the crafts, he is deft and tireless, gifted with an inquiring turn of mind into ways and means. He is able to arrange and carry out his job. This is called achievement in alertness. And what tiger foot is achievement in weariness? Herein, whatsoever wealth a clansman get together by work and zeal, collect by the strength of his arm, earn by the sweat of his brow, and justly obtain in a lawful manner, such he keeps by watch and ward, thinking, Now how can I arrange so that rajas may not get this wealth out of me, nor thieves steal it, no fire consume it, no water carry it off, no treacherous airs make off with it. This is called achievement in weariness. And what tiger foot is good company? Herein, in whatsoever village or market town a clansman dwell, he consorts, converses, engages in talk with householders or householders' sons, young men reared in virtue, old men old in virtue, full of faith, virtue, charity, and wisdom. He emulates the fullness of faith in such as are full of faith. He emulates the fullness of virtue in such as are full of virtue. He emulates the fullness of charity in such as are full of charity. He emulates the fullness of wisdom in such as are full of wisdom. This is called good company. And what tiger foot is the even life? Herein, a clansman, while experiencing both gain and loss in wealth, continues his business serenely, not unduly elated or depressed. He thinks, thus my income, after deducting the loss, will stand at so much, and my outgoings will not exceed my income. 
This is one who carries scales, or his apprentice knows on holding up the balance that either by so much it has dipped down or by so much it has tilted up. Even so, a tiger foot, a clansman experiencing both gain and loss, continues his business serenely, neither unduly elated nor unduly depressed, but realizes that after allowing for the loss, his income will stand at so much, and that his outgoings will not exceed his income. If, Tigerfoot, this clansman have but small earnings and live on a grand scale, it will be rumored of him. This clansman eats his wealth like a fig tree glutton, and if his earnings be great and he live meanly, Rumor will say of him, this clansman will die like a starveling. Wherefore, this clansman continues his business serenely, knowing that his outgoings will not exceed his income. This is called the even life. Tigerfoot, the four channels for the flowing away of amassed wealth are these. Looseness with women, debauchery in drinking, knavery in dice play and friendship companionship and intimacy with evil doers, such just as in the case of a great reservoir with only four inlets and only four outlets. If a man should close the inlets and open the outlets, and there should be no proper fall of rain, a lessening is to be expected in that great reservoir and not an increase. Even so, Tigerfoot, there are these four channels for the flowing away of amassed wealth, looseness with women, debauchery in drinking, knavery in dice play, and friendship, companionship, and intimacy with evil doers. Tigerfoot, the four channels for the flowing in of great wealth are these, abstinence from looseness with women, from debauchery in drinking, from knavery in dice play, and having friendship, companionship, and intimacy with the good. Just as in the case of a great reservoir, with only four inlets and only four outlets, if a man should open the inlets and close the outlets, and if there should be a proper fall of rain, an increase may be expected in that great reservoir and not a lessening. Even so, Tigerfoot, there are these four channels for the flowing in of great wealth, abstinence from looseness with women, from debauchery in drinking, from knavery in dice play, and the friendship, companionship, and intimacy with the good. These, Tigerfoot, are the four conditions which lead to a clansman advantage and happiness here on earth. These four conditions, Tigerfoot, lead to a clansman's advantage and happiness in the world to come. But for achievement in faith, achievement in virtue, achievement in charity, and achievement in wisdom. And what is achievement in faith? Herein a clansman has faith and believes in the awakening of the Tathagata, thinking of a truth, he is the exalted one. This is called achievement in faith. And what is achievement in virtue? Herein a clansman abstains from taking life, from, from stealing, from adultery, from lying, and from taking liquor. This is called achievement in virtue. And what is achievement in charity? Herein a clansman dwells at, at home with heart purged of the stain of avarice, and... Um, etc., etc. This is called achievement in charity. And what is achievement in wisdom? Herein a clansman is wise and is endowed with wisdom into the rise and fall of things, etc. This is called achievement in wisdom. These tigerfoot are the four conditions which lead to a clansman's advantage and happiness in the world to come. That's the end of the sutta. So this sutta is a very practical sutta for lay persons eh? and because this person who came to ask the Buddha he said he still wants to enjoy life as a lay person eh? but what are the things that he should cultivate so the Buddha told him eh, uh, that uh, he should uh, cultivate achievement in alertness eh? achievement in weariness and keep good company eh? and have an even life eh? And achievement in alertness uh, is to be uh, skillful uh, in his work, uh, in his job. Weariness uh, is to be able to guard his wealth, uh, his property. Good company uh, is keeping company with good persons. Uh, and even life uh, is to be able to uh, spend his money 
uh, wisely and not not exceeding his income and not to be unduly elated or depressed. Uh. And then the four channels for the flowing away of of wealth uh, is looseness with women, drinking, gambling, uh, and having evil friends. Uh. Uh, and um, the opposite uh, leads to flowing in of great wealth. Uh. And then four things lead to a person's advantage and happiness in the world to come, just as before, uh, is the achievement in faith, having the faith in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, virtue, keeping the precepts, charity, that means uh, uh, gen- being generous uh, and practicing charity. And the last one is wisdom, that means knowing that things are impermanent, that they arise and pass away. Yeah? And that basically means uh, understanding the Dhamma. So these are the things uh, uh, that uh, uh, that will bring a person happiness in the world to come. And today we come to Sutta 8.6.58. The Buddha said, Monks, a monk is endowed <coughs> with eight qualities. A monk who is endowed with eight qualities is worthy of offerings, worthy of gifts, worthy of oblations, deserves to be reverently saluted, the world's peerless feel for merit. What eight? Hearing a monk is virtuous. He is learned. Number two. Number three, he dwells strenuous, steadfast, energetic, shirking not the burden of righteousness or wholesomeness. Number four, he is a forest dweller, having his bed and seat apart from mankind. Number five, enduring likes and dislikes, dwelling in continuous mastery of dislikes which arise. Number six, enduring fear and dismay, dwelling in continuous mastery of fear and dismay which arise. Number seven, he attains to the four jhana states. Number eight, he destroys the asavas. He who is endowed with these eight qualities is worthy of offerings, worthy of gifts, worthy of oblations, deserves to be reverently saluted. The world's peerless feel for merit. That's the end of the sutta. So these are the eight uh, qualities uh, which makes a monk very virtuous and worthy of uh, salutations. Uh, number one, he's virtuous. Number two, he's learned. That means he's learned in the Dhamma, the Buddha's teachings, uh, more specifically the Dhamma Vinaya, the suttas and the Vinaya. And then number three, he is energetic, uh, always um, getting rid of uh, unwholesome states of mind uh, and developing wholesome states of mind. Number four, he is a forest dweller. That means um, he dwells in seclusion, having his um, lodgings uh, away from mankind. Number five, <coughs> he is always uh, trying to master dislikes which arise. Uh, uh, and number six, he's uh, always trying to master fear which arise. Fear which arise is more likely in lonely places. Uh, if a monk dwells alone in lonely places, uh, sometimes at night, uh, uh, there might be certain things, certain sounds which make him afraid. Uh, so he has to master the fear. Number seven, he attains to the four jhanas. The four jhanas, the jhanas are considered Uttari Manusa Dhamma, higher than human attainment. That is why uh, if a person can attain the jhanas, uh, he is worthy of um, reverence. And the last one, he destroys the asavas, uh, becomes liberated.